following podcast is an exclusive presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Hey folks, Brian Keane here. You know, summer's over. We're entering the fall and then the winter. Halloween's coming up, Thanksgiving, and then of course the holiday shopping season. Speaking of the holiday shopping season, let me tell you about subculturecorsets.com. They've got everything you need for everyone on your list for this holiday season. Clothing, accessories, gifts, books, you name it. They've got it. They sponsor every show on the Project Entertainment Network, including this one. So please give them your business. Visit subculturecorsets.com. Project Entertainment Network presents My Favorite Story, an anthology featuring short fiction written by the hosts of the Project Entertainment Network podcasts with Mary San Giovanni and Brian Keane from The Horror Show, Chuck Builder, Aaron Sweet, El Mahari, and Armand Rosamilia of The Mando Method, Jeannie Engel of Origins, Bizung's Mr. Frank, Tom Clark from Necrocast, Ick On, It Cooks, Amber Fallon, Three Guys with Beards, Christopher Golden, Jim Moore, and Jonathan Mabry, The Buttercup of Doom, Kelly Owen, Matters of Faith's J. Wilbun, John Urbansik of Eight Stains, My Favorite Story, a podcast author anthology from Project Entertainment Network, available on Kindle, Nook, and soon in paperback from the Project Entertainment Network store. There shall come a podcast. A podcast like no other. Defenders Dialogue with Brian Keane and Christopher Golden. Marvel Comics original superhero non-team convenes once again. The Incredible Hulk, the Savage Submariner, the Master of the Mystic Arts, Doctor Strange, and a dynamic supporting cast of Marvel superheroes battle against evil as the Defenders. Without further ado, true believers, here's your hosts, Brian Keane and Christopher Golden, Excelsior. And welcome back once again to Defenders Dialogue. I'm Brian Keane. And I am the much less ebullient Christopher Golden. Much less what? Ebullient. Boy, that's a, a $10 ST Yoshi word right there, if I ever <laughs> No, no, it's a Marvel bullpen word. <laughs> it, you know, the uh, ST Yoshi would uh, not be bothered with the Marvel bullpen, I'm sure. I, I wonder if ST Yoshi read Bronze Age Marvel comics. Do you think that's what went wrong for him? He was never playing <laughs> with things like this. I I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe he enjoyed them and then felt dirty, so his disdain only grew. I, I imagine he was probably more of a an Archie Comics kind of kid. <laughs> hey, don't knock Archie Comics. <laughs> I mean, anything I, you you can anything you could associate with him right now would would uh, would make the other thing seem you know you know tainted by comparison. Or by that's association. True. That's, that's, that's true. And I won't knock Archie Comics. Uh, they're one of the few mainstream comic publishers that actually paid me money for something, but <laughs> did not publish it, but but still paid me. Oh, um, wow. You, you know, know, people who listen, that's an episode of the horror show right there. Uh, people oh, we, will, we, people yeah, will envision talk- <laughs> Brian Keene writing Archie Comics. Yeah, they, uh, they tapped Rachel Deering and I to do... Uh, a grown-up horror version of one of their characters. I, unfortunately, a uh, non-disclosure prevents me from saying which, but I see. Uh, the two of us uh, turned in the script for the first issue, and they bought it, and they paid us money, and then they canceled the entire thing. So. That's funny. And, well, they probably came to their senses and thought, we can't allow Brian and Rachel to do that. No. But, but you know what they can allow us to do? What's that? True believers, we can uh, we can talk about Defenders, issues... 65 we can today. we can 65 uh is an interesting issue because it's sort of a uh it's a bridge between uh the defenders for a day uh and then the uh defenders asgard saga which i can't wait to talk about because it brings up massive issues but in any case <laughs> 65 is Written by David Kraft and drawn by Don Perlin and Bruce D. And I don't know who Bruce D. was. I assume he was some guy who was crashing in Don Perlin's New York apartment at the time and helped him out. Maybe. Um, But anyway, of ambitions and giant amoebas, we begin, Brian, in the aftermath of the Defenders for a Day saga with... uh, the police screaming at Hellcat, blaming the Defenders for the chaos that we left off with last week, and the villains are being arrested. 
the uh, the heroes are are all holding their heads because Hellcat has used her heretofore unexploited psychic powers to uh, you know uh, to lay them all low. So the heroes are uh, are you know having a, a headache moment. They all look hungover, and they're leaving. And we have the uh, traditional goofy Patsy dialogue when the cop is yelling at her. She says, "Golly, don't be sore, sir." <laughs> um, but my favorite line is the one that follows that, Brian. Uh, the porcupine is holding the hand of a police officer who's leading him away, saying, please, officer, take the porcupine to a nice, safe jail. That's right. This is his his second tussle now with the defenders. And I, I think the porcupine has had enough. Yeah, he's had enough of the defenders. Um, anyway, so there you go. That's where we start. Uh yeah, we have Hercules Alloy, but then we go to Brian, to, uh, and I keep returning to you with this uh, subject matter. Uh, what, would you like to discuss the Red Guardian? Well, yeah, then we then we go to the Red Guardian. Uh, if you've listened to previous episodes, you know I feel she's one of the most tragically underused, uh, underappreciated Defender characters, and really one of the, the most underappreciated characters in Marvel's vast library of characters. Uh but when we last left off with Red Guardian, uh, she's in Russia, Soviet Russia, and they have her. She's not imprisoned, but basically she has to live by herself in this uh, in this this chamber, lead lined chamber, because she's you know she's exuding radiation, um, and it has her thinking back to her childhood and her life and uh, the friendship she had with the defenders. It, it's a nice callback to her history with the team um and then suddenly uh you know her her russian handlers tell her that uh you know sergey codename sergey who as longtime listeners know is sometimes called the presence and sometimes called codename sergey they marvel could never decide uh he has been spotted in the forbidden zone and he has reactivated a deadly radioactive amoeba and they need to send uh, Red Guardian after him. I just love that we get to talk about the you know giant radioactive um, sentient amoeba. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Red Guardian goes. She finds that code name Sergey is uh, is inside the amoeba, has been sucked in, and she thinks that he's waving for her to rescue him. But in fact, he's trying to wave her away. Um, so she also gets sucked into the the giant amoeba. Right. And we cut to uh, the Richmond Riding Academy on Staten Island, where uh, v Nighthawk and Valkyrie are arriving back. Um, and uh, in the aftermath of Valkyrie having a berserker moment on the Staten Island ferry, uh, in which she had hallucinations and started attacking people around her, and even now she's having some psychological issues. The battle lust is seizing her again. She's very irritable and short with, with Nighthawk, which is different because she put up puts up with a lot of crap from Kyle Richmond. Um, so, uh, you know, she gets back to, uh, he gets back to uh, the ranch. Uh, he puts up a sign after this, my other favorite part of this issue, he puts a sign up on the front door saying, Scram superheroes, no more defenders needed. Uh, and then he sees that uh, Valkyrie is losing her shit again. And he he dunks her in the uh, in the water trough uh, to cool her down. Uh, then we get to this scene that sort of suggests to me that uh, that Kraft is thinking that he doesn't know what to do with Patsy next with yes. Hellcat, and so he decides that that's her problem too. Is that she doesn't know what to do next? You think? Yeah, I think that's probably an apt summary. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I get the feeling with a lot of these characters that, you know, that it took Kraft a, a while to figure out what to do with them. Um, yeah. and, and I think we see that definitely on, on display here with Hellcat. Should we talk about the history of Millie the model? I mean, do you think it's yeah, that we should at least mention though? we should at least mention that that she appears here. So. All right. So so the the gist of this is that uh, for those of you who are unaware 
uh, you youngsters who are unaware. Uh, we mentioned before on the show that Hellcat is Patsy Walker. And Patsy Walker was the, uh, the star of her own uh, comic book series, predating, and by more than one, actually, predating a number of, uh, of superhero comics. Oh, yeah. Um, you go back to 1944. Uh, Patsy Walker first appeared in Miss America Magazine number two in 1944, which is, that's crazy if you think about it. Yep. Um, so she's one of the oldest Marvel characters. And she had multiple, multiple sort of, uh, I guess you could say, like Archie Comics, uh, Patsy yep. Walker, Patsy and Hetty, Patsy and her pals. Um, my mother, my mother used to read Patsy Walker, Patsy Walker and Katie Keene. Yep. Uh, th- those were her, her comics. And I remember as a kid, Showing my mother, hey, you know, here's here's Patsy Walker and the Defenders, and she kind of turned up her nose and said, "That's not my Patsy Walker." Right. You know. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. So so then um, Millie the model, in a weird way, um, and I, in, again, I never read any of these. Obviously, I wasn't born, uh, you know, but uh, I'm only sort of aware of them because of Hellcat, right? Right. Um, but uh, but Millie the model also became. Uh, super popular. Uh, Millie came uh, around in what I'm, I'm reading as winter 1945. So Patsy predates her, which surprises me because I was more aware of Millie the model. But in any case, uh, Patsy shows up to Glamour Girls Inc., uh, which is the new modeling agency run by Millie. Uh, and they sort of rekindle their old friendship and uh, Patsy shares that she's sort of trying to figure out what to do with herself. And interestingly, for those who've watched the Defenders TV series on Netflix, uh, Millie's position here is sort of a lot like Patsy's or Trish Walker's mother in the Jessica Jones TV series. Um, because she's the one who's basically saying, look, your life is boring. Let's get you restarted. Like the answer to everything is more shallowness from Millie's point of view. But Patsy wants more than that. Um she doesn't know what she's in for. It. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think I, I do think it's interesting, Brian, to think about the fact that these characters, um, you know, they predate essentially anyone who's ever appeared in the Defenders, other than yep. Captain America, probably. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, oh, and, and I, I shouldn't say that. that. Namor, obviously. Well, yeah, Namor and the original Human Torch, whose body was repurposed to build the Vision. Right. Um, but what I what I do like, you know, as I I'm on record as saying, Hellcat does not become a character I enjoy until J M Dematis gets his hands on her. Um, but I will give Kraft props. This is probably the best, most honest characterization for Patsy Walker that that we've seen since since the character has entered the Defenders. Um, you know, I, I actually care about her on these pages. Uh, right. She has some depth to her. Well, you get, it's a moment where you think Kraft is trying to figure out what to do with her. And so she's trying to figure out what to do with herself. I think that it really works. Yeah. So we get back to, um, we get back to Sergei and, uh, and the red guardian and he's right. feeling, although he was a sort of madman, he's feeling horribly guilty uh, that he sort of ended up, you know, being the reason she is also stuck in here. He's in love with her. He realizes he's been selfish and he uh, he grabs her hand, and much like the Wonder Twins in the 1970s uh, Justice or Super Friends cartoons, when they grab hands, they're more powerful. That's right. As you remember from uh, previous episodes, the, the last time these two joined hands, it started an atomic reaction. Uh, the same thing happens now, and they end up freeing themselves of the amoeba, and then we get our obligatory 70s Marvel fight scene. But what I like about this fight scene, Chris, it's not just pow, blam, bop. It's it's the two of them thinking about their relationship and their love for each other while they're beating the shit out of this giant radioactive <laughs> <laughs> I do I do feel like um, th- that could be its own... You know, they should have made it a TV movie in that in that era, the giant amoeba, you know, or a, or you know, some crappy. It's like a '50s atomic monster movie, yeah, only with '70s uh, Soviet characters. Um, but yeah, so 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 they obviously they 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 win the day, um, and they realize, you know, Sergey has a uh, an epiphany where he realizes that 
his his ambition has has been his undoing, and uh, they've they've created with this, or he's created with this this area of Russia that is um, you know or Siberia where that is completely ruined by radiation. But uh, they've poisoned the area. But uh, his one ambition is to uh, to earn her affection. Uh, she says he already has. Uh, and they're going to stay in this place, this dead area of Siberia, where they won't endanger the people around them with their own radioactivity, et cetera, et cetera. So. Right. And, Chris, I I can't remember, but I believe this is Red Guardian's last appearance. Um, I, don't, I don't remember either, but I think that's, well, at least for, I think she does, re you mean last appearance ever? In the Defenders, yeah. Yeah, um, interesting. I don't think J.M. DeMattis uses her in the Six-Fingered Hand saga, although a lot yeah. of Defenders come back for that 100th issue. Yeah, um, interesting. Yeah, But yeah, I, I think this might be, you know, I know Marvel has had other Red Guardians since then, but it, it, I, I don't, I don't want to Google it now while we're live on the air. I should have beforehand, but uh, maybe a listener out there can tell. Is this, in fact, the last appearance of Dr. Tanya Belinsky? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Well, I'll you know we'll 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 find it. I don't I don't yeah. mind looking stuff up here. Yeah, we we then get a, a a three panel interlude. You know, usually the three panel interludes are are reserved for Jack Norris. Uh, but now, <laughs> you know, now that and Jack Nick Fury. Off, yeah, now that he's <laughs> off with Shield, it's it's Dollar Bill and Professor Turk and uh, Ledge, the the human praying mantis. <laughs> and I, I I don't know it. it it accomplishes, it accomplishes nothing uh, other than, you know, Dollar Bill mentions to Professor Turk, who, again, by the way, reminder, he is the crazy vigilante known as Lunatic. Uh, Dollar Bill mentions that, you know, he's pissed off the defenders, and Professor Turk says, well, I'll help you get back into their good graces. Right. Yeah, interesting. Um, just to get back to uh, Red Guardian for a minute, because I did look it up. Uh, this is the, the last time she appears in the Defenders, for sure. Okay. Um, she later, actually, uh, becomes a character called Starlight, um, which huh. is not, you know, not our, uh, our thing. She takes the name Starlight, uh, after regaining her freedom. Um, yeah, anyway, well, it, it's because she, she appears after this, she appears in Incredible Hulk once. She appears in three issues of Quasar. Uh, later in Marvel Comics Presents, and uh, and then subsequently and finally in uh, two issues of Dark Star and the Winter Guard. Just in oh. case anybody's interested, I uh, I think the character. You're right. I mean, the character had a lot more she could have been doing. And in fact, given the current uh, world politic or world political climate, uh, it would be interesting to see her again. Oh, she's ripe for a rebirth. Right um, now. So in any case, yes. Then we finish the the issue with uh, Nighthawk worrying about Valkyrie. Um, she's finally fallen asleep uh, on the sofa. The fire is burning in the fireplace. And she glances into the fireplace and feels like she's being summoned. She feels like someone's summoning her. She doesn't know why. She she has a flash of herself, a vision in, of herself engaged in some kind of uh, battle. And then uh, there's a flash. Uh, an Aragorn vanishes. And Nighthawk and Hellcat run in and they find that Valkyrie is gone and has left a note saying she will never see them again, Brian. Right. Which, Which leads, leads us into yeah. Defender 66. <laughs> now, how many of our listeners have seen Thor Ragnarok? Um, probably much, most of them. Yeah, much of this will probably seem familiar to you if you have. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll say something nice about it. I really, really like Ed Hannigan's artwork. Yeah. Uh, 66. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, I'm glad you said that because one of the reasons why we can do these three issues in the, in the time we have remaining here is because I don't think we're going to talk that much about them, about, no. the, about breaking them down. Um, uh, this, this issue 66 is written by Kraft, uh, pencils by Ed Hannigan, inks by B. Patterson. Um, again, don't know who that is. Um, this is 1978, by the way, I should mention. And I'm back to floppy comics, so I'm going to mention advertising as we go through because I love that stuff. Um, here's here's the big thing I want to talk about about these issues, Brian. Okay. This is a really, really interesting moment for me in the 70s Marvel comics because David Kraft either has completely forgotten Valkyrie's origin 
or has decided to completely change it and not mention it. Yes. Because it's frustrating. Yes, it's it's very frustrating because again, these days they change characters' origins on a whim. Like every new person who takes over a book is like, nah, I'm gonna ignore that and just come up with something else. Um, but in those days, they didn't make those kinds of changes without showing the change, without a revelation. But what's happened here is sort of two things at once. The first thing, well, the second thing we'll have to bring up when we get to it. But what's happened here is Valkyrie, we begin with Hemdel on, on Bifrost, the, or Bifrost, the rainbow bridge, and uh, on the way to Asgard. And Valkyrie says, hail to thee, noble Heimdall. I have been too long away from Asgard. Well, our character Valkyrie uh, has never been to Asgard. She's right. the physical body of Barbara Norris inhabited by a, a completely invented consciousness created by the Enchantress uh, to be sort of the ultimate Asgardian woman warrior. But she's a fabrication. She was created. Um, she's not actually a Valkyrie. She's not actually uh, from Asgard. Uh, but from this moment forward, that whole origin is ignored. Exactly. Um, which is fine. I actually prefer this um, myself. Um, but we have Valkyrie arriving in Asgard uh, and sort of happy to be back, quote unquote. And it turns out that she is not just uh, one of the Valkyrie of, of Asgard, of Valhalla, where the, uh, we should explain for those who don't know, in Norse mythology, Valhalla is the place where the uh, the fallen warriors will uh, will feast uh, and drink in the hall of heroes for eternity, or until they feel like returning to the land of the living and battling again. And the Valkyrie are the choosers of the slain. They're the ones who go out after battles and pick which heroes are uh, worthy enough to join them in Valhalla. Right. And Valkyrie, our Valkyrie, it turns out, is not just a Valkyrie; she is Brunhilda the leader of the Valkyries, which Kraft just puts in here as if it were always the case. Right. Um, so anyway, that's my, my backstory. Yeah. <laughs> you can keep going. I, that's how, that's how little I enjoyed these three. <laughs> uh, then of course, okay. Gila, uh, Valkyrie, Valkyrie is being shown these visions by the three fates. Um, and she sees, uh, a holocaust. She sees uh, Valhalla torn apart by civil war and civil war and and not not the civil war, not the Marvel civil war, but uh, a different civil war. She sees Asgard in ruins. Uh, she sees Hela, the goddess of death, floating over it all, claiming even the defenders. Um, Valkyrie, of course, thinks that this is Ragnarok um, taking place, but. It is not Ragnarok. Uh, the fates tell them that it is a future far worse, devoid of all hope, if indeed that future falls into the hands of a madman with the power to inflict death arbitrarily at will. Um, now, we don't yet know who that madman is. Uh, you know, Valkyrie asks the fates, is there any hope? Uh, and the fates say, for you, Valkyrie, there is none. And then they show her more visions. Uh, we see Val Valkyrie sent to uh, Niflheim. I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, yeah, that's it's, it's, uh, that's how we'll pronounce it. We, we yeah. always pronounce things our own way anyway. Yeah, it's basically the, uh, the Asgardian version of hell. And, well, I think uh, we should also say here that, that what appears to have happened is that Odin is, like, depressed. <laughs> and has not been paying attention. And so, uh, Hela is now in control. Uh, you know, I think you were just saying of, of both hell and Valhalla. Um, right. so, so whatever's going on here, <laughs> the fates make these, uh, make these claims. Um, and they show Valkyrie these visions and including of her being in hell and, and suffering for all eternity or what have you. And, uh, so then we go back to, um, you know, to her sort of dealing with that. And we cut back to Patsy. Right. And she's having nightmares that seem to uh, eerily echo the visions that Valkyrie has been shown. 
Uh, and then we get a couple panels of of character development. She's thinking back to her conversation yeah. with Millie. And I want to I want to I want to break in here with this two panel scene at the bottom of that page, which is set up for something. Oh, I'm sorry. It, it it does carry over for three more panels on the next page, but it's uh it's a conversation between two members of the uh, Justice Department in New York City uh, who have found out that Kyle Richmond, according to them, is a crook involved in stock manipulation, fraud, and tax evasion. Uh, and then, at least for the next two issues, we don't come back to that story. Yeah. <laughs> so it's laid in here, and then for the rest of this story arc, it vanishes. Um, anyway, so we introduce a bunch of the gods. We introduce uh, Hela, and uh, we, we meet this character who I don't remember ever seeing the word barbarian in Norse mythology. No. But he's referred to as Lord Harrokin, um, a, uh, a barbarian, like, sort of warrior leader. And, um, and he uh, ha leads the armies of, of Hela. Right. Um, and he becomes a sort of love interest for, for Valkyrie. Now... I'm pressing the pause button, Brian, because we've come to the best ad in this whole issue. <laughs> Remember, my friend, it is 1978 in America, and everyone has Saturday morning fever. But Saturday morning fever is especially on the rise on NBC. See, the adults had Saturday night fever, and we had what the ad calls Saturday morning fever. Because at 10.30 Eastern Time, the new Fantastic Four is on the cartoon featuring the Invisible Herbie Woman. the Robot. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was getting there. <laughs> featuring no, not the Human Torch because for some reason the Human Torch was too complicated for animation. No, that's not the reason. Featuring Herbie the Robot. Why is what? Why was Herbie the Robot there? Uh, in in now this this is canon as far as I know. I I've spoken to several creators from from that era. Um, the Television network were worried about the character of the Human Torch. Uh, you'll remember. I don't. I don't know if you were this kid, but I was this kid. I was obsessed with Evil Can Evil, and uh, anytime, anytime he jumped his motorcycle over something, I would go out and try to jump things on my BMX so bike. So they were worried kids were going to set themselves on fire. Exactly. They were. They were worried that Human <laughs> Torch would have kids trying to set themselves on fire, and they replaced him with Herbie the Robot. <laughs> All I can think about. Is Dan Aykroyd on Saturday Night Live defending himself against his company's irresponsible Halloween costumes, including Johnny Human Torch, which was a bunch of oily rags and a lighter. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, 9.30 Eastern was Jenna of the Jungle, and she was part of the Godzilla Power Hour. So Remember, this ad uh, also includes an image of Godzilla and Godzuki. Um, and also the, uh, at, at not at eight o'clock Eastern Yogi's space race, um, which was sort of like wacky races only in space. Uh, I don't remember that one. It must not have lasted very yeah, long. Yeah. I don't remember that one at all. Anyway, back to the, back to our, uh, back to our regular feature here. So yeah, it, it turns out Hella has actually summoned Valkyrie, uh, because, Olorus the Unmerciful is this this big bad that Valkyrie's been shown the visions of, um, and in Hela, Hela wants Valkyrie to uh, lead the other Valkyries um, alongside the Barbarians' legions against Olorus's army. Well, and, and I will. I just have to interrupt with a couple of things here. First, that Olorus's uh, sidekick is called. Popo the Cunning. Yes. Popo the Cunning. Um, and there's a sorceress called, I think, did you just say Cassiolina? Right. Uh, and I have to say, man, I have, and I read these at least twice, once upon a time. But rereading this, aside from sort of the covers and a couple of vague things, I had almost zero recollection of this story arc. And there's a reason for that. Right. Um, I mean, we've seen Cassio Cassiolina before. She appeared in Defenders number four. Okay. Um, if you go back in our archives and, and listen to 
episode number four, we talk about her. But there she was a she was a fully fleshed character. Right. I, here she's like wallpaper, as are all these other characters. Yeah. Yeah, there's just... I don't know. I, I just it just lands really flat for me in so many ways. It does. There's and a, I there's... love Norse mythology. Yeah. And this is so basically you have the two armies fighting. Uh, that uh, Olorus is uh, it wants to be the new lord of the dead or the king of the god of the dead, and uh, uh, so he's taking his. Uh, he wants to create an army to go up against Hela's army. Um, we have battle, battle, battle. We have uh, hostess cupcakes ad, which is better than the battle. Um, and but but the significant thing that happens here, Brian, is the final page, um, which is that Valkyrie goes into a, a sort of cave or a cell, uh, and she is attacked because she's distracted in the moment by the discovery of her body in her old costume lying on a slab, and what it turns out to be is it's her body as a goddess which is why Kraft, I'm sure, changed the origin because he needed to be able to do this. So essentially, Valkyrie is in the body of Barbara Norris. Barbara Norris is in the body of the Asgardian Valkyrie. Uh, and they get the drop. She and Olorus and Cassiolina get the drop on uh, on Valkyrie. Oh, and Popo, they're all there. Um, get the drop on Valkyrie, and they knock her out. And so right. Barbara Norris says, I will live again. The Valkyrie is vanquished. Um, I, I, I'm not a fan of this arc. <laughs> no, I'm I'm not either. I'm not either. Uh, but we do have to talk about it, which leads yes. us to issue sixty-seven. Sixty-seven. Um, I will say the the I was excited because the cover of sixty-seven shows Doctor Strange joining them just in time to to help out. But um, unfortunately. That is the only appearance of Doctor Strange in this arc is the cover yeah. of issue 67. Yeah, he's not in the damn book at all. No, not at all. But not Hulk all. is. And we open with Hulk, you know, once again, doing his favorite thing. He's out in the woods, communing with nature, wanting to be left alone. So, exactly. of course, Army shows up. Well, let me, let me just interrupt by saying, this one, the plot uh, is by Kraft and Hannigan, and the script and pencils are by Ed Hannigan. So Hannigan himself scripted this issue. Right. Um, so that's interesting. We haven't seen that before. Um, but he does. Woods are peaceful. No one is here to bother the Hulk. So Hulk likes Woods. Um, and uh, and I like the fact that one of the soldiers actually feels bad. Like, m you know, we should, we should, you know, we should leave him alone. Um, but of course they don't. Right. Uh, and the reason they don't is because Hulk has decided to, to, Commune with nature in a state park, uh, and that that gives them the right. So they try to gas them. Uh, that doesn't work. Hulk, of course, easily beats them and flees. Um, and then, while he's in the air, his heart stops beating and he dies. Yeah, that was that was interesting. He dies and his body falls in in, in an area they don't know that he's dead. Um, they they basically decide they're not going to chase him. Maybe the air recon guys will find him. And what they're unaware of is that Hulk is lying dead uh, below the cliff that they're standing on. Um, anyway, we're back in Valhalla. We sort of recap what's been going on, um, which we've already told you, so we don't need to do that. And then we see Brian... Uh, something that maybe I missed last issue, or, or, or maybe it just wasn't clear to me, but the dumbest element of this story arc, which is that Olorus and Popo and Ca Cassiolina's hideout, their headquarters, is a uh, a big mountain peak that just slides across the land, driven yeah. by magic. Um, this is really fucking dumb. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I mean, as much fun as we had last week, I'm just like, I'm reading this, I'm just like, what... What even is this? Um, anyway, so so we continue. Um, then we've got we've got uh, Hellcat and uh, Kyle in the Hellcat mobile, and uh, she's she's driving along the Hudson River um, on this this really steep windy hill, and she's driving too fast. 
and Kyle is urging her to slow down, and then they come head to head with a tractor trailer, and they fly over the cliff, and their car explodes. Um, but turns out they think they survived the accident. They think you know, they've been thrown free of the vehicle, and actually, this was my favorite thing in this arc in these three issues. Uh, because I love the scene. It's it's right out of classic horror movies, where basically they're they they've been thrown free. Kyle says, "I or he's Nighthawk now. I can't believe it. No one can survive an accident like that, but somehow we did." And uh, Patsy says, "Maybe a steady diet of superheroing had something to do with it." Hey, look, the cops won't they be surprised to see us? But the uh, the EMTs and the police come down, and they don't see them. They're invisible to them. And Nighthawk and, and Hellcat are figuring out, well, shit, we're actually dead. And they see a white light coming, and Hellcat thinks it must be the afterlife. But no, it's Valkyrie on her gleaming chariot coming to collect them to bring them to uh, to the afterlife in Valhalla. Um, yeah, so it's that's that was interesting to me. Um, by the way, Brian, another, another uh, break for station identification... Uh, in 1978, you could subscribe to Pizzazz, Marvel's most off-the-wall mag, and get six months of your favorite comic free. Um, <laughs> I never subscribed to Pizzazz, but I always thought I should have. I uh, I I don't know. I don't remember subscribing, and yet I I had a few issues of Pizzazz back in the day. <laughs> I was always uh, more of a fan of of Marvel's humor magazine, Crazy, which was sort of their answer to Mad Magazine. Yep. Uh, edited by Steve Gerber, as a matter of fact. Um, yeah, yeah, but, interesting. Well, so we, we get... get back to we we should we should we talk about the villain's really stupid plan here? No, <laughs> I mean we can tell we can say I think all we need to say is the idea here is that because he now is controlling whatever he's controlling, Alaris is using Cassiolina's magic, and they're basically finding people on Midgard, aka Earth. Um, who will be uh, good warriors for them. And they're essentially taking them to the afterworld, uh, to Valhalla, to whatever, to create their own army of warriors to send up against Hela's army. But um, here's, here's what I find so stupid. Now, this is the Marvel Universe. Right. They're looking for warriors. They don't go for Frank Castle, a.k.a. the Punisher. They right. don't go for, you know... Jack of Hearts or Paladin or or Devil Slayer, they, right? They go for just some some random red shirt. Yep, on the street. Yeah, a bunch of random red shirts. Yeah, yeah. This is yeah. So in any case, Valkyrie is in her cell. Uh, she's now in her old costume because big reveal, folks. Barbara Norris has swapped costumes with her, so she's now wearing Valkyrie's new costume so that she can fool Nighthawk and Hellcat into thinking she's the Valkyrie that they know. Valkyrie's now in her old costume. She's in this cell. She's uh, sort of uh, taunted by these guards who are wearing really weird uh, sort of BDSM uh, outfits. Um, but hey, comics, folks. Um, and Valkyrie smashes her way out through the wall. Uh, it, it's the outer wall of the mountain. And she finds she's attacked by dragons created by Cassiolina. Um, and essentially we end up with... Uh, Valkyrie arriving with all of these people who've been stolen from Earth, including the Hulk. And Hulk and Hellcat and Nighthawk and the Barbara Norris Valkyrie uh, are, are united. And basically, under the pretense that this is the Valkyrie they know, they're being recruited to fight against Hela. Now, I will say, Brian, the cover of issue 68... Uh, is one of my favorite covers. So strangely, even though I can't stand this uh, this arc, I I love this cover. It's Hulk smashing the mountain. Spoilers: We now know what happens at the end of this arc. Yeah. Um, and it says, "When falls the mountain?" And it has the horrified, shocked reactions of Valkyrie, Nighthawk, and Hellcat. But uh, I don't know. I always love that cover. Trapped beyond the gates of death, the defenders fight on. Um, now we have story by Kraft and Hannigan, pencils by Herb Trimpey. Um, so Hannigan's not drawing this one. Inks by the legendary Pablo Marcus. Right. Um, so and this one is called, in in true seventies fashion, Valhalla can wait. 
uh, reference to the film Heaven Can Wait. Um, but anyway, take it take it from here, Brian. I don't want to take it from here. <laughs> I, I mean, if you want my summation of issue 68, the defenders fight a whole bunch of Olorus's army, and uh, at the end, uh, the good Valkyrie is stuck in Barbara Norris's body and goes back to Earth. The end. <laughs> Yeah, she's still stuck in Barbara Norris's body, and they go back to Earth. Well, so that's that's probably a pretty good summation. Let's just go through to see if there's anything of of value in here. There's there's not. The, well, well, the there, first there thing I will say is page. there's a fantastic one page ad for the Micronauts, <laughs> and the I never read the, the Micronauts, um, and I probably would hate it. But um, was it for the toy or the comic? No, for the comic. Because the micro Marvel's Micronauts comic was fantastic written by mantlo and drawn by michael golden no relation yes, um, yes. and it, uh yeah you never you never read the micronauts no i never did it was it didn't appeal to me i don't know oh my god it has one of the best man thing appearances outside of his own book ever <laughs> all right well you, maybe I'll no, get i don't it. even want to talk about this terrible issue of defenders let's let's finish the show talking about the micronauts <laughs> Well, I think at some point maybe I'll have to read the Micronauts and then we can do that episode. Um, but uh, I just want to talk about the ads because this one has several ads that I actually, no joke, like I was reading this and I was thinking we need to talk about this. There's a great ad uh, that says, Behold the Marvel Galaxy of Superstars. And it has the Man Called Nova, Captain Marvel, uh, the Hands of Shang-Chi, Master of Kung Fu, the Incredible Hulk, Daredevil, the Man Without Fear. And I just look at that and I think, boy, the 70s were great. Uh, I, I, it's a great ad. Um, yeah, so let's see. I'm flipping through the issue, Brian, really quickly to see if there's anything else I even want to talk about. It's just not, it's not good except the idea that, uh, that they've set up this relationship, um, potentially with this character who I don't think ever appears again. Um, but I also wanted to, to take some time, since we, we have a little time because we didn't like this arc, to read this letter on the letters page. Okay. Which, to remind folks, the letters page was Defender's Dialogue, our inspiration. It's from a guy named Terrence Folger, who lived in Bayonne, New Jersey at the time. And it says, Dear Armadillos, Ever since Dave Kraft took over the Defenders, the book has gone down the drain. I was going to write to you about the situation before this, but I kept on putting it off. Then came issue 63. Now, the reason I'm reading this, Brian, is because he's the opposite of us. <laughs> the opening scene is what gets me mad. Havoc is my personal favorite. He blasts the Hulk. The result, Hulk frowns. You are seriously underestimating Havoc's powers. Didn't you read Incredible Hulk 150? Old Green's kid could not have forgotten the little bug in the black suit. One of the few to beat him. The first step in improving the Defenders has already been made, getting rid of Keith Giffen. <laughs> even though, so, you know, for you, for you, wait, even though I Sal's just, I, artwork uh, in 63 was putrid, we've seen what he can do. Or ask Carmen Infantino to come back. George Perez has done great with other groups, so he would do good on this book. Keep a stable lineup. The group should consist of the following. Doctor Strange, <laughs> Valkyrie, Hercules, Torpedo, Havoc, and Polaris. Hulk just wasn't made to be a in a team, and Herc makes up for his muscles. Hellcat irritates me. The real cat was 100% better. Nighthawk is a jerk. Just follow my instructions, and you will have one hell of a great book. Wow. <laughs> so so for, our, for our younger listeners, the next time you're reading the comment section on Bleeding Cool or... <laughs> The comment section on that uh, that Diversity in Comics Guys YouTube channel, or, or anywhere comic fans are arguing with each other and, and telling the editors and the creators that they know better. Yeah, yes. Remember this, Terrence this, Folger. Yeah. Don't, kids, don't be Terrence Folger. Terrence Folger, the OG of comic book fans. <laughs> anyway... So the only other two things I wanted to mention about this issue uh, are, are I did actually like the scene where the Hulk beats the shit out of the mountain and, and goes under the mountain and destroys it from within. That was fun. And Brian, I know you'll appreciate it because even before I knew this was 1978, I actually had to check the indicia to, to find out. 
Um, I guessed it because I got to the last page of the comic and the inside the back cover has an ad that says Kiss, a milestone. And it's the four solo albums from Paul Stanley, Gene Simmons, Peter Chris, and Ace Fraley. And I thought, Brian Keene probably owned those albums. I owned all four of them. How did I know? I, I owned all, I, I saved up my allowance money and uh, <laughs> my paper route money. And I actually, I actually bought less comics that month because I, yes, I owned all four of those. Ace Freely's uh, was the best of those four, by the way. Well, I have to say I was a Kiss fan in 1978, but I did not buy any of those. And I don't think I've ever heard any of the things on those albums, even though I loved the band at that time. I was just like, no, I'm sorry. If they're not Kiss, I'm not interested um, I was so angry because I believe it was that year or the year before that, actually, I would have been 10 and 70. No, yeah, I would have been 10 and 77. Um, and uh, my brother got to go see Kiss with my with my older sister. And I was so mad because he was 12. Yeah, I was 10. I was like, come on, I want to go see Gene Simmons breathe fire and puke blood and and sing Shout It Out Loud. I, um, I saw that tour. I was I was also 10 years old. Um, you know, I grew up in a really rural area, and uh, most of the kids I hung out with were all high school kids. And, you know, they thought it was fun to let little 10-year-old me hang out with them, so they'd turn me on to, like, Rush, and, you know, beer and stuff like that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, Kiss was playing, uh, I think it was the York Fairgrounds, and uh, they somehow convinced my parents that it would be a good idea to take me along. And uh, I remember how the air smelled at the concert. What's that smell? Well, that's that's <laughs> marijuana. <laughs> What's marijuana? <laughs> Can I get some of that? <laughs> oh well, and I have to say, my friend, that uh, uh, the following year, when I was eleven, I did go to my my actual first concert, and my actual first concert was slightly different from Kiss. It was the Charlie Daniels Band. I saw that too. That was my parents took me to that. I think I was eleven years old. Yeah, I was eleven. That was my yep. first ever concert. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Um, well, and I will say, flipping pages back slightly. Um, oh, also the, the the ad facing that is for the um, the the Foot Locker of the Hundred Toy Soldiers. And every time I see the ad, I'm like, I want to order that. Um, my blood ran cold, Brian reading the reference to the next issue because it says next the ever deadly omegatron that's right a classic defenders supervillain uh making a reappearance in the book but i just have a terrible feeling that this is not going to go well <laughs> well but the the omegatron in both of its appearances has has been phenomenal are, are... i mean I... Have you looked up the word phenomenal? Is that like one you're familiar with the definition of? <laughs> I, I like the Omegatron, and I like that Doctor Strange's plan was to just slow down time. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I I, I don't know. We'll, we'll talk about this next uh, next episode, but uh, but we'll see. I mean, I, I will say that it's, it's a one-off uh, storyline because it leads into, uh, into 70... And I will say, by the way, we should point out that at this point, artist Ed Hannigan uh, is writing the Defenders. Right. Uh, so, so he's uh, he's in there writing the Defenders, and we have uh, we, we have coming up. We have Omegatron. We have some resolution to the Lunatic story, which then leads into a, a multi-part interdimensional saga. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it'll be it'll be interesting. So I think we'll get we'll get. You know, three or four issues in next episode, we'll have to decide as we go. Um, but uh, but yeah, so we'll get probably four issues in. Um, but yeah, with with Ed Hannigan now taking the reins as writer. That's right. Yeah. All right. Well, folks, if you enjoyed this show, uh, please consider going on iTunes and leaving us a, a review and letting other folks know that you enjoyed the show. Uh, also, you might enjoy Three Guys with Beards. That's a podcast that Chris hosts every week with James Moore and Jonathan Mayberry. And you might also check out The Horror Show with Brian Keene. Uh, judging by the name, you can guess I'm involved with that, along with uh, Mary San Giovanni and Dave Thomas. Uh, a shout-out to our engineer, Tommy Clark. He's got a podcast called Necrocasticon. All of these podcasts 
are brought to you by the Project Entertainment Network, and they're available on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Spotify, and all other platforms. Chris, send us home. You know, Brian, all I can say is this arc makes me a little less likely to shout Excelsior, but what the hell? Excelsior, true believers! We'll be back next week with better comics than this one. <laughs> Bye! Three Guys with Beards, the Project Entertainment Network store, featuring t-shirts, mugs, stickers, the decent more from your favorite Project Entertainment Network podcasts. Ink stains, scribblers rest. The Horror Show with Brian Keane. Why not show your loyalty by wearing a cool product from the podcast group and show off to your friends? It cooks. Armcast. The Mondo Method Monster Attack. Necrocastic. Go to projectentertainmentnetwork.com and click on the store tab for more details. The Liars Club Podcast. Bizarre. The Lunch Ladies Book Club. Matters of Faith. The Project Entertainment Network Store. Stacked with stuff from the best podcasts on the internet. The Curtain Jerkers. Buttercup of Doom. www.projectentertainmentnetwork.com You're listening to American Top 40. More tragedy in the news today. Kim Kardashian has a new baby. What the hell? There's nothing good to listen to. Hey, wait, what's this? You gotta roll that out. See, it makes me do weird things and I like it. God damn it. I'd be going down on myself. Shit. Hey guys, it's Bill, Mick, Maya, and Junior from the Unsupervised Podcast. Check us out every Thursday on the Project Entertainment Network. Take a break from the stress of the world and come have a laugh with or at us. Bill. <laughs> this has been an exclusive presentation of the Project Entertainment Network. <laughs>